Leopold's soldiers were being ordered to cut off the right hands of dead bodies. Each soldier was issued a fixed number of cartridges before a raid, and to prove to the white officers that he hadn't wasted any, the soldier had to bring back a cut hand for each cartridge that he'd fired. Ma boko ana, kukata awa, awa, huyo bakata kili boso, eh, kukata ma boko, awa. Bongo bitumba, oye ba mindele ba memaki, wana bino bo bundaki na bangoto? Ah, obu na mindele uzi wa makasi wapi. Makasi uti pari. Mindele wa kautu ba zaki penda batu mabe? Mabe. In each army unit, soldiers were designated to smoke the cut hands to preserve them. The hands were then taken to the officers to show that all the ammunition had been well used. On the 14th of December, 1895, Mr. Schoblum, Mrs. Banks and myself saw one of these sentries with a, a basket full of smoked hands. We got the sentry to stop and show us how many he had. He took them out of the basket and laid them in a row before us. Eighteen right hands of men women and children. The sentry wanted to beat the woman who was carrying them for him, as he said there ought to be 19 and she had lost one. Surely the king of the Belgians cannot be cognizant of these barbarous proceedings on the part of his servants. A confidential letter sent by a courtier to the chief executive of the Congo Free State revealed that Leopold was angry about being criticized for the cruelties in the Congo. But the letter also quotes the king as saying, I know that atrocities are being committed in the Congo. It is useless to try to deny it. I think one can assume that he knew, maybe not all the details, but that he knew that the system of exploitation of the rubber in the Congo uh, had uh, gruesome effects. The point is, did he consider it gruesome? Probably not. He thought this was the price that has to be paid for uh, economic development or whatever. He didn't care very much. He uh, thought that the profits were more important. Tanga Mundela yakina basuda na yepo na kuba mabiso. Na kima kina mwana nanga ya mobali na mapeka. Lisa si moko elele la kinga ina litoi. Ezwa kinga yete kasi na kwe ina mabele. Tango na telemi, na sundoli mwana nanga ipo na koka kukima mbangu. Tango na zongi na ndako, ndeko nangai ya mobali ya zaleki kukumba mwana nangai na maboko. Basiko kata yelo boko moko na likolo. Antwerp was where the Congo rubber arrived. According to legend, the city's name comes from a confrontation between a Roman soldier and a giant who also cut off hands. Any connection between the city's symbol and cut hands in the Congo is seldom made in Antwerp. It's as though the crimes of the Congo are totally forgotten, or worse, never happened.
un bilan humain, rien ne l'exprime mieux qu'un adage des gens de l'Équateur. « Beto fe bole iwo »« Le caoutchouc est la mort ». En 1920, le Congo compte 10 millions d'habitants. Par rapport à 1880, c'est deux fois moins. Donc en 40 ans, le pays a perdu 10 millions de personnes globalement. Mais dans certaines localités, les pertes s'élèvent à 60, 70, 90 Donc le caoutchouc a été la catastrophe. Jamais les peuples du Congo n'avaient connu un désastre pareil. It was in the Equator province where many of the worst abuses occurred. Leopold had divided the Congo into separate districts, each under the control of a commissioner, most often recruited from and paid by the Belgian army. The Equator was run by an official who stands out as one of the great villains of the Congo Free State. Leon Fievé was a master in the use of violence to increase the rubber exports. He collected rubber in enormous quantities at a rate of one ton a day, it said. Common report on the Congo states that he caused more than 1,000 persons to be mutilated. It's also reported that he boasted of the cruelties. And certainly the result of them is evident to this day, for the people fled from the district in their thousands and have never returned. When General Wahis Governor General of the Congo made an official visit to the Equator region in 1896. Even he called it the land of horrors. Fieve had no qualms about the level of brutality. He perfectly understood that the state existed only to make money and that rubber was the key. For Leopold, Fieve was the perfect employee, loyal, efficient, and resourceful. Je réunis les chefs des villages voisins et leur ordonne de me rapporter un certain nombre de chikwang, du poisson, etc. Au jour convenu, pas de chikwang. Devant cette mauvaise volonté manifeste, je leur fais la guerre. Un exemple suffit, sans tête tranchée, et depuis lors les vivres abondent dans la station. Mon but est en somme humanitaire. Je supprime cent existence, mais cela permet à 500 autres de vivre. All that mattered to Leopold was to keep up the supply of rubber. But to get the Congolese to work hard, he had to find a way to make his agents work hard as well. A confidential message went to the Governor General. Leopold was transmitting his greed to the agents. The state was going to pay commission to stimulate zeal. Agenten, zowel de justitiecommissaris tot de laatste agent, die kregen dus premies. Dus hoe meer rubber, hoe meer premies. Dus die mensen, omdat zij zagen dat men kon moorden en branden en plunderen en statistisch doen, zonder dat er enige gevolg aangegeven werd van hoger hand, zonder dat er enige onderzoek volgde of zonder resultaten, dan dacht men dat het allemaal toegelaten was. En het systeem was werkelijk uh, de wortel van al het kwaad. Daar ben ik volledig van overtuigd. Native life is considered of no value by the Belgians. No wonder the state is hated. They talk of philanthropy and civilization. Where it is, I do not know. The state has not suppressed slavery, but established a monopoly by driving out the Arab competitors. This is no reasonable way of settling the land, it is merely persecution. <laughs> if the Arabs had been the masters, it would be styled iniquitous trafficking in human flesh and blood. 
but being under the administration of the Congo Free State, it is merely a part of liberating the natives. Charles Stokes, a British trader working for the Germans, was about to cause the king his first major political problem. Leopold was jealously guarding his trade in the Congo, completely against the agreements made with the European powers at Berlin. The king's orders were to enforce the monopoly fiercely. Stokes was arrested for trading in state territory and sentenced to death by Captain Hubert Lothaire, an officer well-known in the Congo. The people on the Lulanga River call him Lofembe. Some four years ago, he arrived with black troops and pitched his camp. He sent over to the missionary to use his influence to get the natives back. The missionary, supposing he was dealing with an officer and a gentleman, induced the natives to come to the station. As soon as they did so, Lothair and his men opened fire on them. The hanging was a major political mistake. Up till then, the victims of the Congo Free State had been African. There was outrage in Britain and Germany. In the end, the king had to pay compensation to both countries, and from now on, the European powers were increasingly wary of Leopold. To tear treasure out of the bowels of the land was their desire, with no more moral purpose at the back of it than there is in burglars breaking into a safe. Leopold's response to the pressure on him after the Stokes affair was very Leopold. He set up new concessions to exploit the rubber. He claimed he was opening the Congo to outsiders, but the king made sure his men were on the boards of the new companies and he took 50% of the profits. One of the concessions was given to Abir, the Anglo-Belgian rubber company at Bassan Kusu. Here, the rubber was dried before it was sent down river to be shipped to Antwerp, and the concession companies had found new ways of maximizing profit. Leopold's new companies were taking the wives of the rubber collectors hostage. The women were only released when sufficient rubber had been collected. The hostage system was organized by the concession companies with the full knowledge of the state and of the king himself. On official company forms, the names of the hostages were recorded along with the details of their condition and the length of time they were to be detained. The procedure was so institutionalized that each of the company's agents was given an official hostage license, authorizing them to detain women at will. Les femmes prises à la dernière palabre d'un coetra me donnent du fil à retordre. Tous les soldats voudraient en avoir une. Les sentinelles chargées de la surveillance des chaînes libèrent les plus jolies et les violent. When a missionary asked a chief how many women had been taken hostage, the chief replied, count the grains of sand, white man. Yes, 
The moment of truth in Leopold's Congo Free State came once every 15 days when the rubber was handed in. The state talked about the rubber harvest and the rubber market, but the reality was completely different. For the collectors, this was when they would either get their wives back or face more punishment, even death, if they had not met their targets. For the agents, this was when they would be able to start calculating their commission. And for the king, this was the proof that his new concession companies worked and brought him even more wealth. En six ans, les profits nets s'élèvent à 720 000 livres pour un capital souscrit de 9 300 livres environ. Et l'action achetée 4 livres rapporte 335 livres. Mais le roi a un appétit d'ogre, insatiable. Il veut toujours plus. En fait, si le roi devient riche, la Belgique aussi devient riche. Donc ce que Léopold II transmet à la Belgique, ce n'est pas seulement le Congo. C'est aussi le système des compagnies concessionnaires, avec euh, toute leur force de corruption et aussi avec euh, tous les abus qui leur sont associés. Leopold's stranglehold on the rubber market lasted for over 10 years till the plantations of Asia and South America became serious competition. The profits all went to Belgium, but how much remains in the hands of the royal family today is still a matter of speculation. Leopold once said about his Congo, what I do there is done as a Christian duty to the poor Africans, and I do not wish to have one franc back of all the money I have expended. As the 20th century began, King Leopold found himself facing the first major challenge to his rule in Africa, and it came from London. En 1900, paraît dans The Speaker une série d'articles qui constituent un événement. L'auteur, visiblement très bien informé, avance des faits, des certitudes, pas des insinuations. Le coup est très bien joué parce que les articles sont anonymes, ce qui suscite une curiosité générale. Qui est l'auteur Que veut-il L'auteur de ces articles, c'est Edmund Dean Morrell. Edmund Dean Morrell is one of history's most underestimated heroes. He rose from being a shipping clerk to Leopold's foremost adversary. He didn't have Leopold's royal pedigree, but in everything else, Morrell was more than a match for the king. A Liverpool shipping line handled Leopold's rubber cargoes, and Morrell got his first job there. But he soon became a leading journalist on West African affairs. Because he's working in the West African trade, he specializes in West African news. So he's somebody who becomes a specialist and expert in West and Central African affairs. And when he becomes chief clerk to the Congo business, he's somebody who does a lot of to and froing between Antwerp and Liverpool, because Antwerp is where a great deal of the Congo trade is unloaded. At Antwerp docks, Morel started unraveling the truth about Leopold's Congo. He described it as stumbling upon a secret society of murderers. Morel est un expert du commerce colonial. Il est le premier à travailler sur les documents officiels de l'État indépendant du Congo et à faire parler ses propres statistiques. Avec lui, la protestation morale contre Léopold II cède la place à l'analyse du système et une analyse implacable. Puisque l'argent n'entre pas au Congo comme investissement ou comme salaire, une seule chose peut expliquer les quantités de caoutchouc et d'ivoire qui augmentent. Cette chose, le cœur du système léopoldien, c'est le travail forcé. Morel moved to Harden in Wales, left his job at the shipping line and began a personal campaign against the king. In six months, he sent out 15,000 brochures and 3,700 letters. 
Within a year, Morel had his own newspaper, the West African Mail. Now he could get his message to an even wider audience. From his offices in Liverpool, Morel gathered together all the stories he could about the events in the Congo. And he set about trying to enlist the missionaries' help. But since the first wave of outbursts against Leopold, the missionaries had gone silent. They had the evidence, they had the details, they had the stories that were going to grab popular imagination and that were going to make the campaign take off. But selfishly, the missionary societies didn't want these stories circulated because they didn't want to offend Leopold. They felt if they were critical at all, they would be thrown out, and that meant that they wouldn't achieve their ultimate end, which was the, the maximum conversion of African souls. I think they had a rather mechanistic view of what they were doing. And one soul converted was one step nearer the second coming, if you like. And if those converted souls were subsequently mutilated or murdered, well, so be it. They died Christians, so, so what? Step by step, Morel persuaded the missionaries to come forward with articles for his West African mail. One of the first was Charles Banks from the Equator region. We heard a report that the state soldiers had attacked the village of Bandakawajiko because the rubber was not of the best quality. In a little shed lay one of my late school children, a promising young lad. I lifted the leaves by which he was covered and saw that his right hand had been cut off. I then went through the village and saw the people burying their dead. I counted over 20 bodies and newly filled graves. All the bodies had the right hand cut off. Morel recherche l'efficacité. Pour réussir, il a besoin de tout le monde, de toutes les forces morales, spirituelles, matérielles. Alors, peu importe ses propres convictions religieuses, il a besoin des missionnaires, il les gagne à sa cause. Peu importe ses idées sociales, il a besoin des hommes d'affaires, il les rallie à lui. En réunissant tout ce monde autour de lui, il se révèle un très habile tacticien politique. Seven thousand miles away, Morel now had a new ally. A stream of letters arrived at the Foreign Office in London. The British government had appointed a consul to Leopold's Congo Free State, and the new consul was outraged. Captain Van Kerkhoven told me that he used to pay his native soldiers five brass rods per human head they brought him in during the course of any military operations. The consul was Roger Casement, a man with 20 years of African experience. Casement is a hugely romantic figure. He's somebody rather like Lawrence of Arabia. But he's someone who I think one could say was probably a generation or a generation and a half ahead of his time in terms of his attitude towards the Africans. He said himself that, that he loved the Africans. He liked them. He liked their company. He wanted them to be friends. They liked him. He was someone who treated Africans with much more gentility, with much more consideration than was usual for the time. In 1903, Casement spent two months traveling into the Upper Congo. Morel's campaign had pressured the British government into conducting an official investigation. Wherever Casement went, he talked to Africans and recorded their testimony. Mondele Azalaki Koloba Nabasuda Baye Bozali Kobomaka Kabasi Kasi Mibalite Bola Kisate Bozali Koboma Pe Mibali Tango Bazalaki Kobete Biso Masasi Bazalaki Ko Kata, Nzuto, Yabiso, Mibal, Poya Komemele, Mondele, Ungambo Yaye, Azalaki Koloba, Yasolo, 
bobomi mibali. Casement realized, as had Morel, that the missionaries were the key witnesses, and he wanted to persuade them to go public with what they knew. He visited the town of Ikoko on Lake Tumba, where the missionary Joseph Clark lived. <laughs> Joseph Clark was known to the Africans then and now as Pebby. He had been in the Congo for over 20 years. Clark and his wife supplied evidence and witnesses of the state's atrocities. Caseman stayed with them for 17 days. Mokolo mosusu babomaka ndeko na ngai ya mwasi pe bakata ka ye moto maboko na makolo po alata ki pauni kombo ya ye mobe The villagers of Ikoko still have to use the same school and church that Joseph Clark built for them a hundred years ago. On a beach by Lake Tumba, Casement recorded how a boy had both his hands beaten off by soldiers while a white officer known as Ika Tankoy, the leopard's paw, stood by. The white man, Ika Tankoy, was not far off and could see what they were doing. Ika Tankoy was drinking palm wine while the soldiers beat the boy's hands off with their rifle butts against a tree. <laughs> The boy's name was Mola. Morel published his photograph in the West African Mail. Casement was so horrified by everything that he'd seen that on the day he left for England, he delivered a vitriolic letter to the Governor General, knowing full well that meant that he would never be allowed to return. From the earliest days of the Congo Free State, book after book had appeared, regaling readers with tales of the horrors to be found there. Others, like Stanley, had told a different story. But the king was facing a mounting tide of criticism. A war of words started. Leopold commissioned books and bribed journalists. He established propaganda offices in Brussels, Frankfurt, and America to defend his regime. He published a monthly magazine that was circulated around Europe. Morel fought back, and now he had another secret to reveal. The West African Mail 
published a report on a part of the Congo that no one had known even existed. Soudainement, au plus fort des accusations contre l'État indépendant du Congo, on apprend l'existence de l'autre côté du lac Tumba, à 100 km d'ici, du domaine de la Couronne. Ce domaine, propriété privée à l'intérieur de la propriété personnelle du roi, a été créé en 1896, mais son existence a été tenue secrète jusqu'en 1902. The Crown Domain, 10 times the size of Belgium, was completely sealed off. But a missionary had managed to get in. Morel got hold of his journal and published the atrocities committed by Charles Massard, a Belgian officer known to the Africans as Malu Malu. The white man, Malu Malu, I feel ashamed of my color every time I think of him, would stand at the door of the store to receive the rubber from the poor, trembling wretches. One man bringing in under the proper amount. The white man flies into a rage and seizing a rifle from one of the guards shoots him dead on the spot. The men who had tried to run from the country and had been caught were brought to the station and made to stand one behind the other as an Albini bullet was sent through them. A pity to waste bullets on such wretches. Some of the stories are unprintable, and much that I heard would not pass muster in court. But there were too many witnesses, and the consistencies were too many for it all to be lies. Baron Jules Jacques is a Belgian hero of the First World War. In Leopold's time, he was one of the men that the king trusted to run the crown domain. His behavior is well illustrated in a memo that is kept by the Belgian Foreign Ministry, but which is officially a secret document to this day. Monsieur le chef de poste, décidément ces gens d'Inongo constituent une bien vilaine engeance. Ils sont venus couper les lianes à caoutchouc à Ibali. Nous devrons taper sur eux jusqu'à soumission absolue ou extinction complète. Prévenez-les que s'ils coupent encore une liane, je les exterminerai tous. Jusqu'au dernier. Leopold's personal profit from his crown domain was 231 million euros. As the movement against Leopold gathered momentum, Morel decided to turn up the pressure. Liverpool became the headquarters of the new Congo Reform Association. Lorsqu'en 1904, Morel fonde l'Association pour la réforme du Congo, il vient de lancer le premier mouvement humanitaire du XXe siècle, dont il va faire d'ailleurs une formidable machine pour soulever l'opinion. C'est lui qui, à partir de Liverpool, va l'étendre sur toute la Grande-Bretagne. C'est grâce à ses efforts que le mouvement va déborder sur le continent européen. C'est encore lui qui va l'implanter aux États-Unis et en faire un mouvement transatlantique. Donc, grâce à Morel, l'Association pour la réforme du Congo devient une gigantesque coalition absolument irrésistible. Morel's Congo Reform Association took the cruelty of Leopold's Congo to public meetings across the country. A hymn was especially composed. Britons, awake, let righteous ire kindle within your soul a fire. Let indignation's sacred flame burn for the Congo's wrongs and shame. He was a genius propagandist. He really dragged the issue. 